So let's go welcome everyone uh, to this panel. I'm very happy to have a bunch of friends sitting here with me today. <laughs> um, so as you all know, M&A is all about expectations, before, during and after. I'm going to have Sanford speak first, do the opening gambit. Um, we're going to try and discuss around four topics today. So that's going to be innovation, real innovation, B2B and technology, mega mergers, as Sanford knows all about that, and maybe Latin America a little bit. Or is that for Latin If America? you're up for that. Uh, so Sanford, can you tell us a little bit what's been happening and what we can expect? Yeah, sure. So let me, let me kind of unpack how I've seen it over the last few years. So if we look back to 2020, I think across the board, inside, outside gaming, you had just this absolute cacophony of deals. I mean, we at Oakville did a, a huge number, and I think that was driven by SPACs, it was driven by low interest rates, it was driven by free money, essentially free money, and people were doing deals for deals' sake. So you had Rush Street SPACing, you had Golden Nugget, you had all sorts of, I think DraftKings really led the way in that respect. And then people were kind of valuing businesses on a next year's fictitious revenue. And we as bankers love that. I mean, it was great, but that has evolved quite significantly over the last couple of years. So moving into 22, I think seller expectations didn't come down, but buyer expectations did. And so what we started to see is this evolution, which I think we'll see more of this year, of focusing on kind of two types of deals, either very profitable businesses that are not growing, being bought on lower multiples, or I think there'll always be a market for profitable, high growth businesses in certain key geos. So what I saw in 23, and we were involved in a lot of these, in fact, we're probably responsible for Entain not having too much cash left to spend, but they were buying, and I think they were very sensible deals, but others may disagree, they were buying STS in Poland, they were buying Supersport in Croatia. Those were the very profitable quasi, I don't want to say monopolistic, but very, very strong first positions in Croatia and Poland. And then they were also looking at um, <clears throat> strategic deals. So Angstrom was their very strategic deal, which had no connectivity really to financials in terms of the valuation. It was a deal that they needed for BetMGM to deliver on same game parlays and so on and so forth. So I think as we look forward, what we'll see is we'll see deals based on fundamentals. We'll see more consolidation in the affiliate space. I think the media companies, they had their, their moment in time in 2020 and 21 where they were doing these mega deals with PointsBet and others, and they were really making hay while the sun shines. I think now it's really about profitability. It's look at Better Collective. We just sold them Playmaker. I think we'll see more of those types of deals in the market. So. Uh, my sense is a mix of strategic deals where operators and platform providers can improve their products and then entry into new markets, hence Latin America and so on and so forth. Thank you for that. So, Max, I'm going to turn it over to you as you had your own announcement just now. Um, tell us a little bit about the B2B space, the importance of owning tech, vertical integrations. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, uh, and yeah, thanks for raising it. Obviously, we, we closed our funding raise uh, recently and that was announced this morning. So that's very pleasing, particularly to do that at this, this event and welcome OpenBet as a, an investor alongside Betson and Knutson, who are, well, were one of the largest shareholders of NetEnt. So that's great for us. But I think from the B2B space, that's actually something that perhaps, you know, there's a lot of discussions around M&A activity, mainly in B2C that you were discussing there, but there's actually a huge amount of, consolidation or opportunity to look at B2B deals that are happening at the moment. I mean, the, the, the most obvious one is the aristocrat um, acquisition of Aspire Global that's trying to progress. Um, we've also recently heard the, the discussion of IGTs, Play Digital, et cetera, uh, combining with every. Uh, so I think there's, there's certainly a real progression in this space of B2Bs now consolidating as well, or trying to increase their market share in a particular way. If not by full mergers, then if it's smaller acquisitions or minority investments, whatever it is, that seems to be quite a key predominant thing that I'm seeing this year. And I, I believe that will continue this year as well. well thank you for that. Um, Matt, 
in your case, you have a ton of experience with what happens after, where especially what results from very complex and a lot of M&A. What do you think are the main challenges around things like culture, talent, integra overall integration, managing expectations? Don't use chat GPT. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. So, so Prague is a result of a series of uh, mergers and acquisitions. Um, uh, the first transaction was done back in 2018 when Bragg acquired Oryx. And then we were uh, doing a few things in parallel. Uh, we um, acquired Wall Street Gaming, a studio based out of Las Vegas. So we acquired Spin, another studio and an aggregator based out of uh, Reno, Nevada. And in parallel, we were um, listing the company on NASDAQ. So I think you know the biggest challenge for us was to uh, maintain um, focus on our business. Uh, we actually had three different um, management teams trying to uh, work together um, in creating uh, one team, one company. Uh, and, um, you know, in light of that, um, it was um, pretty difficult for myself personally and obviously for the people in the company to run day to day operations. Um, and try to be as effective as possible in the um, uh, in the transaction and in the go public uh, process as well. The other big thing is uh, management of complex regulatory uh, challenges. We, with the acquisition of Spin, we um, acquired a, a company that was licensed in uh, five, I think, five uh, U.S. states and uh, two Canadian provinces. And that required a lot of effort from the board, from the management team of uh, various companies, key executives, to um, apply and obtain those licenses. And uh, um, I guess banking, the other uh, segment where you have to uh, put a lot of focus on it. And uh, um, the third thing is um, obviously keeping key talent motivated and engaged uh, both in the process and in a day-to-day -day, um, operation. And there are various other challenges that we can speak about, I guess, for hours. Yes, <laughs> probably that's a never-ending story, unfortunately. Yes. We're still in a, a process where we're now, I guess, well consolidated and looking forward to uh, uh, next few years. Good, thank you for that. So last but not least, uh, Evan, so Sanford touched a little bit about the point on, on valuations and generally expectations. Tell us a little bit how you see it as an investor. Um, is it a time of like growth versus profitability? Sanford mentioned fundamentals driven again. So what, what's your take on that? Well, I think we've seen the world change significantly over the last 18 months as Sanford touched upon. You had kind of the euphoria of rising stock prices. Um, you know, supportive capital markets. I think we've we've seen a significant pullback in all of that activity over the last you know 12 months, particularly, and now we're starting to see a little bit of a path forward. I think you know the clarity around rates and kind of where rates are going to go over the next you know six to 12 months provide you know more ammunition on the corporate side. Uh, stock prices have risen, so you're seeing corporates be more active on the M&A side, particularly with venture-backed businesses, as you know you start to go down that growth uh, that growth platform portfolio. Um, you know, high level, I think. You know, there are certain what we're seeing on the venture side is there are a lot of products being brought to market, and companies with innovative products, like you know, I think how we look at potential exits. It's can those products become a larger platform or part of a larger platform? I think, you know, ultimately there are several that will pierce that that kind of barrier. And then a lot of products that will be acquired, whether it's aqua hire for the team and technology um, or actually, you know, acquired by larger corporates that can then you know, use that as product differentiation, because that's what we're seeing now. It's like with the slowing of states new states launching online, you have additional capital now sitting on the balance sheets of, you know, larger B2C platforms. I think you're going to see more product differentiation and focus on how can my product be a little bit different than, than everyone else. 
and those are areas of you know of, of interest for acquisition and ultimately if you look at kind of the multiples being paid if you have one platform or one b2c you know platform buying uh you know a product a lot of their revenue is going to go away because they want that product for themselves right so you have to adjust multiples you have to adjust kind of future earnings for those companies and you know from a venture standpoint like your returns aren't probably going to be as good as you know serving multiple customers and having higher revenue but that's what we factor into how we look at you know ultimate exits for a lot of the the venture back companies yeah i'm going to stay with you for a moment you're living in brazil uh, yes. which is very hot at the moment <laughs> for many reasons so what what's your take on that you know acquisition power being um, driven outside of the U.S. towards new geographies, not just Latin America. I mean, we can certainly discuss Latin America. That's my sweet spot too. But how do you see that? Where, where are, where, what places would you go? Brazil certainly is very hot right now and interesting. Um, and expensive. You know, expensive. I like in Brazil more like Ontario, where there there's a fully built out gray market that's been operating for years there. Um, you know, over 2,000 websites that offer gambling. Um, I love Brazil. I've been there seven years. It's an interesting company from a regulatory and uh, you know kind of overview perspective. I think we need a lot more clarity on how that's actually going to be. Uh, you know. How, how you're gonna move everyone from the dark into the light and how, how the regulators are actually going to punish those who don't. I have low expectations. Exactly. Completely honest. It's, and therein lies the problem, right? Like, you know, I think you're gonna have groups that have, go spend the 30 million hay eyes on a, on, a, on a license, but then potentially have, you know, sites and, you know, send traffic to other sites where they're not paying the tax the customers aren't having to pay the customer tax. Like, you know, it's, it's Brazil. Yeah, but it's, it's such a significant market. I mean, we, we, this is not H2 gambling capital, but this is just looking at the operators. And we think it's over 5 billion of GGR already. And you look at Bet365 being massive in the market. Mm -hmm. And you look at what Betano are doing there, which is unreal in such a short space of time. But I think it's just a very complex a mix of operators, some of which are connected to land-based, some of which are a little bit grayer than others. And I think from an M&A standpoint, given we're talking about M&A, we've certainly found it very hard to transact because most of these operators are local and from and a... structure. They, they just yeah, you know, Curacao license is hard for a land-based operator in the US to acquire. I think what we'll see is a transition once the licensing comes out and once these operators have Brazilian licenses. I think we'll see a lot more M&A in that market. Obviously, you and I worked on the sale of Incabet to Betson. There's going to be more of those local champions in Latin America for sure. Mexico, in my view, is, is five years behind Brazil, which is crazy. I mean, you've obviously got Caliente. And it's that, a two billion market already. Yeah. Yeah, but you've got 120 million people in Mexico. It's just payments and affiliates. Very close developed. to the US, let's not forget that. Yeah, exactly. Um, unless Trump builds his wall. But, but yeah, it's, it's a really fascinating market. I think you see it with Rush Street Interactive. They're now in Colombia. They're in Mexico. They're growing really quickly. They have earnings today. And, and I think they'll continue to want to push in those markets. And ideally, they'd acquire. But it's just finding something that's clean enough to acquire without hair on it. And we know only too well that... You know, when you get into that due diligence stage, you can get to term sheet quite easily. Then you get into due diligence and it gets a little bit... It's hard to find, hard think, to find those operators. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we're going to see a lot of asset deals. I think like mm -hmm. pure carve-outs of databases, brands, those kind of things, because it's very, as Sanford's saying, it's very hard to acquire. Like, the well, and then on the affiliate side, like it's just rinse, wash, and repeat that what we've seen in kind of every market. And I think there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot that can be done down there building you know building that funnel that customer funnel that's not being done now so i think those are those are interesting areas to, to look at from an m&a perspective yeah. i mean i would say that what i see from an m&a standpoint is where as i mentioned in 2020 people were just doing deals for deals sake now they're doing deals for very specific reasons so you're not going to buy something 
in a market where you're already there or you, you have a kind of replacement value, you're going to look at Brazil because you're not there and you want the local infrastructure. In the case of B2B, you're probably, as you go forward after you've done this open bet deal, you're going to start looking at how you can take more of the NGR share because the platform, you take, what, 3 4 5%. Yeah. You want to build towards having more content. But as you know, the whole US market is now more akin to the European market from a content standpoint, and you right. really need a point of difference. I mean, Evolution are buying up a lot of content providers. We saw the big-time games. They had mega ways. I mean, I think everyone's looking for innovation. Evolution just bought live spins. I can see Carolina sitting over there. Fangio's just bought Beyond Play. This is all about innovation at the moment and doing something slightly different. And the juxtaposition of gamblers as creatures of habit with innovation, it's very hard to thread that needle. So M&A, I think, is the, the only way. Definitely. Mats, what's, what's your take on, on what you do with um, the different cultures when you, when you execute an M&A and how do you get that one team? What's, what's kind of the key thing to do? I mean, for us, that was a very painful experience. We obviously tried to... Um, we were a very European, even Slovenian company back in 2018 and we were trying to become a US company and six months which is literally impossible so the uh, you know to change uh, that mindset the, the the values of of the people that are involved it's uh, a much longer process and um, I was personally obviously not um, uh, very experienced in that you know you can um, look at look at um, various other examples and then you try to do it yourself and um, like I said, it's a very painful process and uh, adding more assets on the top of it and, you know, adding uh, an Indian developing team and adding, um, uh, in our case, Israeli management and then adding um, people from the UK and adding people in Latin America just adds to the complexity and it was uh, um, a very complex and a very, like I said, um, um, long process. Melting pot. Yes. <laughs> but Matt, I think before we, we started Strive, I was at Canby and we did a lot of examination of acquisitions and Canby went into the market and did some minority acquisitions and, and some longer term plays. And you actually realise that one of the biggest issues with this whole space, if you're going to bring companies in, is do you actually have a fundamental plan of how that's actually going to work? Correct. Because, you know, a lot of times people are actually just spending most of their time in that spreadsheet and how the revenues will look and what it will mean for their valuations and how important that will be and totally. where we're going to go. And, actually, and then oh, everyone forgets and, it. Yeah, and not many people have talked about, well, what's the plan of actually integrating this organisation and where they are culturally and who's going to join and how they're going to feel. And if you're going to bring in senior people, where they're going to fit in that management team, if they're not going to fit in that management team. And, and thinking, you know, buyouts, future clauses, revenues, are they realistic? Are you going to keep people motivated to try and achieve those if they're unrealistic? And, you know, and all those aspects. And I see it consistently, even throughout our industry, that there's so many issues with that throughout. You know, you, you, know, you probably get the, the, you know, the, the, great, the great light so you can buy the best suit on the, uh, on the stage. Yeah. But then afterwards, <laughs> I suppose it's the, the actual implementation. I think there is quite a lot of issues within that. Uh, even with the big deals that... And I think yeah. in 20 and 21, people just didn't think about it, and you can yeah. see the graveyard yeah. of deals. Exactly. Now, everyone's a little more focused. I mean, you even look at William Hill and 888. That took such a long time to close that by the time it had closed, most of the William Hill management team were so destabilised and disinterested that a lot of them left. So I think that, that brain drain, you've got to come up with ways of incentivizing key people. And that I always think you could do that through a mix of not just earnouts, but a combination where buyer and seller, so the, the buyer can propose an earnout, but the earnout often benefits the major shareholders who actually just want to exit stage left. So really what you need to do is carve out a chunk of that earnout and have the buyer maybe match it in some way and roll that forward into a management incentive package and possibly think more like a private equity vehicle than a straight strategic acquirer. The, different, the, the flip of that is if you're someone like a gaming innovation group 
They bought Ask Gamblers. They bought Cafe Rocks. I think they're probably coming in and they're going to rip the guts out of it and drop the gross margin to the bottom line. So there's sort of different ways of, of doing deals. But if the team are fundamental, that is the only thing I think you yeah. have to think about. But the private equity mentality, let me, let me get back to that for a moment. So I think um, ideally you should go about it in a 10-year time frame, which is what private equity does at the end of the day. A lot of people just don't do that. How, I mean, we have just about three minutes to go. So I'm going to ask the four of you, what's the next mega merger and where? Where is it going to be? Mats, I'm going to start with you. <laughs> have a guess. <laughs> have a guess. Or no know. names, just <laughs> jurisdictions or product. Brad Gaming, no? Yeah. <laughs> mega merger? <laughs> probably not. But, uh, Maybe probably yes. gonna, Yeah, probably going to happen in the US or US more, like US companies buying more European assets. US, buying. Europe. Yeah. Okay. Sanford, no insider. In uh, yeah, I feel like I have to be quite careful here. Um, I can tell you which ones I'd hope for. Um, no, look, I, I think one general point, and we were talking about it yesterday, you look at the recent every IGT deal, and I actually think these mega mergers are going to create huge amounts of opportunity. We were talking about how Scientific Games back in the day merged with Williams with Shuffle Master, and I saw that David Lopez yesterday in his earnings said this creates a huge opportunity for us because we know they're going to lose market share rather than create revenue synergies. So these mega mergers, I think, whilst it's all about counteracting inflation and cost synergy and so on and so forth, I think they're going to create lots of opportunity for the smaller guys who can be more fleet-footed and faster moving. In terms of mega mergers, I'd say I can see Evolution doing something transformational. Maybe they move into other verticals beyond just content, aggregator and live casino. Um, and in terms of operators, it's pro in the US and North America, I think we need to see how Fanatics and ESPN play out a little bit further before we're going to see more operator m and I would just add something to it. I mean, the M&A slows you down significantly and, uh, you know, whatever the next mega merger is going to be in the B2B space, that's an opportunity for smaller companies to go in and take market share of these, uh, you know, B2B companies that are going to be very, very focused on maintaining whatever. Delivering the, exactly. on the synergy. So, yeah. Yeah, and that's why I think it's happening probably with Aristocrat and Aspire, but also... Yeah, anything can happen. You're probably, he knows so much more, but obviously Playtech and 888, I can't wait to see what's going to come out of that. Major issues probably behind the scenes from the B2B Playtech perspective and some of the relationships and customers that they have. Well, look they, at what's happening in Latin America. Yeah, there's, there's, some, there's <laughs> something that's probably going to come out of all this at some point within that. I don't know how much you or anyone else could talk to that. But yeah, I also think there are obviously big companies that are out there, the you know, B2B organizations, probably White Hat Gaming, etc., are out there probably a right for a sale or opportunity or merger out there that's there's possibilities um i think there's a there's a lot out there right now that we that they're in that space so but playtech and 888 be interesting and i don't know what penn national does by the way if you know that's another you know thing with vsbm but they've spent a lot of, Evan, they've spent out a lot of time of indeed. um uh, quickly i think you're going to see consolidation on the tail on the b2c side it may not be the mega mergers but i think from a product perspective a differentiating perspective. I think that's a way to gain market share and have a different product in the market. And I think you're going to see consolidation of the tail. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, guys.